Please welcome Nevada resident David Berman. They gave me a script to work from. It, it's my script. I wrote it. But I have to change the first two words, which were good morning. <laughs> so I'll say good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Berman. Despite my Massachusetts accent, my wife Rosalind and I have lived in a seniors community in Nevada for 23 years. Before that, I served in the United States Air Force, and then I practiced law, and I've been a type 2 diabetic for even longer than that. I want to show you what keeps me alive. Diabetic injection pen. I take a shot with each meal every day, but that's not all. Here's another one. This is a slower-acting insulin. I take a shot before I go to bed. I think all the white coats understand how that works. And that keeps me from dropping too low on my blood sugar at night. In January, thanks to Joe Biden's efforts and the assistance of the Democratic Senate and House of Representatives, my monthly insulin costs dropped by 50%. And I know that countless Americans saw their costs drop even more. That's real money in my pocket, folks. Money that comes in handy on a fixed income. President Biden lowered the cost of insulin. And he has rolled up his sleeves to work on lowering drug costs across the board. Promises made and promises kept. This has been the hallmark of Joe Biden's presidency, and I'm deeply honored to be able to thank him in person and introduce him today. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Joe Biden. <laughs> Doctor, is there a doctor in the house? <clears throat> Are there nurses in the house? Where are the nurses? Now look, I've been a significant consumer of health care. My family has. Doctors let you live. Nurses, male and female, make you want to live. No, I'm serious. The single most underrated profession in America are nurses. I mean it. <clears throat> Let me begin by, uh, by thanking uh, the president of this great university for allowing me to — oh, take a seat if you have one. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Whitefield, thank you — president, a professor as well, but thank you for uh, allowing me back on campus. I have gotten no additional degrees in the lately, but thank you for letting me be here. And, and David, uh, thanks for that introduction. You know, I really mean it. It makes a difference in people's lives, what we're doing and what you all are supporting. And Dina Titus and Steve Horsford, two of the best me members of the Congress that I've ever dealt with. There you are. And uh, we have the Attorney General here, too. <laughs> Folks, uh, you know, uh, Aaron and, and state and local tribal leaders are here. Would the tribal leaders stand up? Because I don't know how many are here. Because I would — there you go. Chief, good to see you, man. And by the way, it's Indian nations. Indian nations. 
And I'm here today to talk about an issue affecting every single American, your health care. And I want to first thank the health care workers in this room. In the, you're in the best of times. I really mean it. In the best of times, you do the Lord's work, but over the last three years during the pandemic, you've literally risked your lives for the rest of us. Health care workers have put their lives on the line, and it matters. And it really, really matters. And I think the American public is beginning to understand just how consequential you are. You're used to going to the dock, but they're not used to the dock going into a tough area to take care of them. And we lost a million people, and we would have lost a lot fewer if we started earlier, not because of the dock's decisions, but because of other decisions made. Oh, wow, I didn't see you all up there. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Don't jump. Don't <laughs> Well, all Americans deserve peace of mind, that if illness strikes or they have an accident that occurs in their family, they can get the care they need, but they can afford the care they need. But the truth is, too many folks lie in bed at night staring at the ceiling wondering what they would do if something happened, if their spouse got a serious illness or if they got very sick, or their child got sick, if something happens to them. You know, I remember we lived in a I, I raised a, in a normal middle-class home back in Delaware, a three-bedroom house with four kids and, and a uh, grandpa living with us, a split-level home. And my bedroom was next to my mom and dad's, my, me and my three brothers. We, we had two sets of bunks. And you could tell when dad was, was, rest, was restless. I remember one night, true story, one night my dad, I could feel like the, he was rolling in bed because the headboard was hit the side of the the wall, the wall, and my and I next morning asked my I said God's truth. Asked my mom. I said I was in I think a junior in high school. I said what's the matter with, with Dad? He said he just we just lost our insurance. His business was no longer going to cover insurance for the employees. It was a consequential decision that affected my dad and would have affected if any one of us had gotten really sick. What happens? Do you have to sell the house? Do you have to make some kind of sacrifice that exceeds what is actually reasonable? And it's about your dignity. You know, do you have enough insurance? Can you afford these medical bills? Can you get, if it gets bad enough, do you have to do something drastic in order to pay for it? And for seniors on fixed income who often need expensive medications to stay healthy, the constant question is, can they pay for the medications? Can they pay the bills without, without giving up the important elements of their lives? Because the bottom line is, at the end of the month, do you have enough to pay all that you need and take care of the exigencies that occur. It's not just the elderly. It's almost every family out there. It's not just your health. It's about your dignity. It's about your security. That's why my administration is focused intensely, intensely on getting more people affordable health care by lowering prescription drug costs and giving families just a little bit, as my dad would say, just a little, little bit of breathing room. We passed the historic laws to get that done. And now we're moving quickly to implement those laws so people can feel the effects of what we did. We passed them last year, but they didn't take effect until January. And the first thing we did was to help people who were truly struggling to gain access to affordable health care through the Affordable Health Care Act, the, the, and that was, or better known as Obamacare. I signed a rescue plan that increased the coverage and lowered prices for affordable health care, saving millions of people about $800 a year. My new budget and my new budget for this year makes that permanent. Almost 100,000 Nevadans get their health care through the Affordable Health Care Act, and 300,000 have coverage because of expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Health Care Act. Unfortunately, my mag and by the way, I mean this sincerely. This is not a broad criticism of all Republicans. This is not your father's Republican Party. This is a different breed of cat now that's in charge. No, but, I, but think, think about it. You know, I knew a lot of good Republicans who represented this state as senators. They were friends. We disagreed, but they had, they, 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 they were conservative Republicans. But these MAGA Republicans, they're a different, they're just different. They continue to be determined to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And you know, it's hard to believe, but they've already voted to change or get rid of the Affordable Care Act since it passed 50 times, 5-0. They failed every time. 
And the one thing I want you to know about the Affordable Care Act is that uh, the way for people with pre-existing conditions to get health care, if you have a pre-existing condition and you can't afford your health care, your, your private plans, you do not get coverage anywhere. And this is the only outfit. If, in fact, you do away with the Affordable Care Act, if you have, an, if you have a pre-existing condition, you don't get coverage otherwise. If MAGA Republicans had their way, as many as 100 million people with pre-existing conditions would lose their protection. That's a fact. And folks, look, the Affordable Health Care Act is also a means by which millions of hardworking Americans have access to preventative care, like cancer screenings. MAGA Republicans put that at risk as well. And nearly 40 million Americans would be in danger of losing coverage completely if they were to succeed. We're making health care more affordable in other ways as well. Last year, I proposed a piece of legislation called the Inflation Reduction Act, which I could – we got it. We got a lot of things done bipartisanly. This one, was, there was not any support on the other team at all. But the result of the law is that seniors on Medicare get common vaccines for things like tetanus, whooping cough, shingles. They get them for free now. They used to cost them up to $200 per shot, average $100 per shot. The new data released today shows that if our plan had been in place in 2021, 3.4 million seniors, including 24,000 Nevada seniors, would have saved an average of $70. You know, Americans spend more on prescription drugs than any advanced nation on Earth, more than any advanced nation on Earth. You name the drug you have to take, and I can take you to France and get it to you a hell of a lot cheaper, to Canada, England, throughout Europe. It's, it's not fair. But after decades of trying to take on Big Pharma, we finally, finally won. Now, instead of paying whatever the drug company wants to charge you, Medicare, Medicare will be able to negotiate prices. Medicare provides... will drive down prices because we give Medicare the power, the same power that the Department of Veterans Affairs has. They can negotiate what they're going to pay for whatever drugs they're prescribing to, their, to the military. Well, I know many of you are health care professionals. You understand this better than anybody else. For example, insulin was invented 100 years ago. And the guy who invented it decided not to patent it because he wanted it to be available. It only costs $10 a vial to make, $10 a vial. If you count everything expanded, you can say you, you get up to 13 bucks if you talk about packaging, shipping, and the rest. And guess what? They're being charged hundreds of dollars a vial. So beginning January 1st of this year, even though we passed the law last year, it wasn't until January 1st I kept telling people it was coming, we capped the cost of insulin at $35, $35 for seniors on Medicare. And, folks, if it had been in effect in 2020, nearly 11,000 Nevada seniors would have saved an average of $439 on their insulin. But I've been calling on my colleagues to cap the cost of for everyone, you know, including 200,000 children who have type 1 diabetes, who need insulin every day to stay alive. I was doing a town hall meeting in Northern Virginia last year, and a woman stood up very sophisticated lady. She said, I have two girls. They both have type 1 diabetes. And she said, and I can't afford, I can't afford it. So what we have to do, we have to ration the insulin between them. Talk about being deprived of your dignity. Man, looking at your child, knowing if they don't get the insulin, their life is literally in danger, and you've got to stand there and not know what to do. Folks, my budget's going to require it. And guess what? The good news is that Eli Lilly, the biggest insulin maker in the United States of America, announced that they're going to answer my call and they're going to make the, the, this insulin available to everyone in America for $35. <laughs> and yesterday, Novadisc, another drug maker, announced they're cutting their prices for insulin as well. Look, folks. Another aspect of the Inflation Reduction Act, and it's a fancy sounding phrase, but is the drug companies that raise prices faster than, 
faster than inflation, have to pay back the difference to Medicare. So if, if, if they're raising the price and, insul- and Medicare and, and, and you have the circumstance where the inflation is up 4 percent and they increase it 12 percent or 15 percent, they have to pay the difference to Medicare. Yesterday I learned that last quarter drug companies hiked the prices for 27 drugs that are on the market above the new limit. Now those manufacturers are going to have to pay the difference back to Medicare. As a result, the Department of Health and Human Services estimate this will make co-pays for those drugs will be as much as $390 cheaper for seniors. Look, it's going to change the way drugs are priced, lower the cost for seniors long term. And it's equally consequential to me that, as many of you in this room know, we're capping out-of-pocket drug expenses for seniors on Medicare at a maximum of $2,000 a year beginning next year. Now, but, but right now, <laughs> right now, we have, regardless of how much they cumulatively are paying for all the drugs they need, and now it's capped in because I've been, my family has been deeply involved as a consequence of cancer and my son dying of stage, my son dying uh, stage three glioblastoma because he was exposed to those burn pits for a year in Iraq. Um, and uh, my fo- anyway, you all, how, how many here have had you or a family member be diagnosed with cancer? Raise your hand. It's probably, as the docs know, the most devastating word they can tell a patient. You got a serious heart disease, you may die. That's worrisome. <laughs> More people die of heart disease than they do from cancer. But cancer scares the living hell out of every single person. Well, folks, you know, a lot of those drugs now that are available that are very helpful. And by the way, I, I've declared war on, on, on cancer. We've set up, no, I really have. I've gotten $5 billion for cancer research through NIH, like we did through the Defense Department for special weapon systems, the same system. But here's the deal. Some people are paying about $10,000, $12,000, a year for expensive treatments like cancer drugs. It's going to give seniors certain peace of mind because no matter how much they pay, no matter how much they pay, they're not going to – how much the, the, the bills are. They'll never have to pay more than $2,000 a year for all the drugs they consume. It changes the peace of mind people have. And guess what? It's going to save seniors money. It's also going to save the government money. My Republican friends say, well, what are you going to cut taxes for the wealthy? I said, no, I got a better way of saving money. Not a joke. If, in fact, you limit the amount of money that can be charged to reasonable prices by the drug companies – You know how much we'll save this year? $160 billion. $160 billion. Why? Because it's $160 billion less they have to pay out to provide the drugs for the seniors. So it's not only the right thing to do, it is a conservative thing to do in terms of cutting the federal budget. But here's the deal. As I've said, this is not your father's Republican Party. The mega Republican in Congress don't think any of this is a good idea. They think big farmers should be able to make the exorbitant profits at the expense of the American people they've been making. And I want to repeal the they want to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act. Roll back savings for seniors, add to the deficit another one point six billion, and continue to line the pockets of big pharma. Look, I'm a capitalist. I want if you go out and make a lot of money, go make the money. Just pay your fair share. Just, just your fair share. No, for real. I have no problem with company making reasonable profits, but my Lord, not on the backs of working families and seniors. And this is really, it gets down to it's about fairness. Fairness and decency and providing people some dignity. Last week, I released my budget. I met, by the way, and I'm t- I apologize to the press is here. They're tired of hearing me say this. I met with the new Speaker of the House. He said he is threatening that we're going to let the federal debt not get paid and put us in turmoil. We've never done that in American history. And the debt is accumulation of debt over 200 years. That's the debt we're talking about. And, uh, 
and, and I want to lay, I said, look, I'll lay out clearly what we support. I'll lay out my budget on March the 9th. You lay out your budget, and we'll negotiate. We'll negotiate. Well, you know, my dad used to have an expression, for real. He said, Joey, when someone said, I tell you what I value, he'd say, don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget. I'll tell you what you value. Show me your budget. <laughs> oh, really, think about it. My budget takes steps to lift the burden on seniors and hardworking Americans so at the end of the month, after busting their necks and their whole lives, they have a little bit left over. That's what it used to be at our kitchen table. At the end of the month, is there anything left? You better pay anything to have a little bit of room. And again, it's about fairness and it's about your dignity. I value everyone having a decent shot. My Republican colleagues now in the House of Representatives, I think it's fair to say, not every one of them, most of them, are now at a point where they have a very different value set. We're strengthening Medicare and Social Security instead of threatening to eliminate them. And the, the MAGA Republicans are in Congress want, are threatening to do. You know, when I did, I don't know what you saw the State of the Union, but it was kind of a fascinating thing. No, no, I didn't say for that reason. I, I was a senator a long time. I'm used to dealing with and uh, speaking to the Congress and the Senate. And so I'm comfortable when I'm doing it. I was standing up there before all the members of the House and the Senate, and I talked about, I read the programs which some of their leaders had put forward to, in fact, cut Social Security and cut Medicare. And the gentle lady, as they say, from uh, Georgia, in the mountains of Georgia, stood up and yelled, liar, liar. And then that generated, last time somebody did that, by the way, they got censored. But no, I'm not joking. But here's what happened. Then another half a dozen, you know, liar, liar, we're not going to do that. I said, oh, if you may remember, I said, oh, you're not going to cut Social Security and Medicare? And they said, we're not going to. And so the whole group cried. I said, everybody who's not going to cut Social Security and Medicare, stand up. They stood up and hollered. Well, they're all on film. <laughs> uh, I hope it's true. <laughs> I hope they've gotten there. Uh, but I'll believe it when I see it. Look, you paid for Social Security from the time you got your first check when you were 16 years old, working as a lifeguard or something, okay? And I'm determined to protect them both. There's ways to protect them without cutting them. Look, let me close with this. You know, uh, let's finish the job. Let's protect the lower prescription drug costs for everyone. Let's expand health care for more people and to get care. Let's keep building the economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not from the top down. And by the way, when that happens, when the middle does well and the bottom rises, the wealthy still do very, very well. And no one, I commit to you, and I committed this when I got elected, when I was running, no one making less than $400,000 will see a penny in federal taxes raised as long as I'm president of the United States of America. <laughs> but look. But again, it's about just, just paying a fair share. When I got elected, there were, I think it was six, don't hold me to the exact number, 690 billionaires in America. There's now 1,000. You know what the average federal tax they pay is? T-H-R-E-E -E percent, three. They pay a lower tax rate than the custodians in this building. They pay a lower tax rate than any of you, basically. And so it's just not fair. I, I think you should be able to be a billionaire if you can earn it. But just pay your fair share. Just pay something. By the way, you know, everybody said, well, how was I able to have these new programs and still cut the deficit $1.7 trillion the last two years? Well, it was pretty, pretty straightforward. There were 550 companies of the Fortune 500 that made $40 billion that didn't pay a penny in tax, zero, nothing, in taxes. So I said the, out, the outrageous, and we got votes for it. I said they ought to pay a minimum of 15%. 15%, that's less than you all pay. Guess what? It allowed me to cut the deficit. So, folks, this is about just basic fairness and decency. There's nothing radical about what I'm proposing. And if you look at the polling data, it's overwhelmingly popular, what we propose. Matter of fact, it's a hell of a lot more popular than I am. <laughs> but I'm serious. 
So I, this is no time to turn around. Look, what the American people understandably, a lot of people have lost faith in government for a lot of reasons. And here's the deal. We promised these things, and they haven't seen it. I don't know whether you've been surprised, but the number of people who have come up to me after January 1st said, I cut, you cut my insulin costs, $35. Like, I didn't believe government would really do it. But there's a lot more coming, a lot more coming. And again, let me end by thanking the medical people that are here and the students. It really matters. It really, really, really matters. And all you have to do, like many people in this audience, have been a consumer, significant consumer of health care. My son spent 18 months knowing he was dying in the hospital. And the docs and nurses just changed it. Changed it. They, they made it. They took care of him. My wife and daughter were killed in a, in a trucking accident. My two boys were expected not to live. You guys saved them. And you saved their sanity as well. So I think that, uh, you know, we vastly underestimate and you underestimate the psychological impact you have on people, not just the medical impact you have on people. So I'm here to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And folks, let's remember. We forget, we are the United States of America, and there's nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we work together. So let's work together. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops.